I have a very lighthearted question for you. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> in the history of politics, if you had to fuck somebody, <laughs> who would you fuck? Fucking Abraham Lincoln. Really? <laughs> no, no. no okay. <laughs> Um, He's long and tall. He's he, tall and skinny, which he, means huge Fonstucker. That's like, right. Uh, hair, <laughs> ha- hairless. No, he's definitely had a, he definitely had uh, unruly pubic hair. His pubic hair looked just like his beard, where it only went around the bottom. But <laughs> first, when you first started asking the question, this voice in my head started going, Dan Quayle, like insanely. But I think it's just because that's when I was like 12 and he was, he you was, know, he was attractive. He's not a bad looking guy. He's like, he looks like a weird, he looks like he's playing a teacher in an 80s movie. Sure. Like he's I just, see, I could see him in definitely, you kept mentioning John Hughes. I could see him in a John Hughes. I got you for two months. Yeah, two and two, buddy. <laughs> two and two. <laughs> Sometimes I think in that I love you, but I know it's only love. Damaged Goods by Gang of Four off their 1979 debut album, Entertainment. It's also number 483 out of 500 on the 500 with Josh Adam Myers. I'm the king of fleece. You're the fleece army. Let's take over the world, everybody, because we got a long way to go on this journey through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the top 500 albums of all time did you pay for your spotify this week ask yourselves that you got a lot of homework to do people thank you guys once again for coming through i i mentioned i wanted you guys to do instagram stories for me and you did it i'll take more guys give me a 24 hour ad on your social media take a screenshot of the 500 and the way you're listening to it, tag me at Josh Adam Myers and hashtag the 500 podcast. And why not throw a hashtag fleece army? Give us that 24 hour ad because I am trying to get the word out. I love you guys. Thank you for the people that did it. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm like giving everybody like rankings in the fleece army. If you join the 500 club, you're immediately a general. I'll say that. But I got to be above that. So what does that make me? The ki- I'm a king. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know military rank. I was literally just a guy's like, I'm like, you're doing a good job. You're a corporal. You're doing a great job. You're a sergeant. Join the fleece army and give us those 24-hour ads on your Instagram stories. This week's guest is one of the coolest, fucking most awesomest people I have ever met in my life. Karen Kilgariff, guys, an incredible writer and stand-up comic and also one half of one of the biggest podcasts out there about true crime, My Favorite Murder. She is so much fun to talk to. And it was like, for me, it was like an honor because I remember her when she was on Mr. Show with Bob and David, which is one of the funniest sketch comedy shows of all time. Her writing is incredible. Her stand-up is incredible. Her podcast is incredible. And when you listen to this episode, you'll realize that she is incredible. And it's just somebody that's always been like near and dear to my heart. And uh, it was awesome being able to sit down here. We talked for three hours. Three hours and we could have kept going. Don't forget to listen to the end of the podcast where we spotlight a new artist that was directly influenced by Gang of Four. Also, rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. The 500 is available on all platforms for free. But this week, guys, I'm going to give a big shout out to my buddy Ned Kenny at Laughable for featuring this killer episode with the one and only Karen Kilgariff. If you're an iPhone user, check it out, the Laughable app. It's the top-rated podcast app in the entire app store. It lets you subscribe not just to podcasts, but also to individual comedians, myself included. I've been on other podcasts probably hundreds of times. They're awaiting you at Laughable. And once you subscribe to me, you'll get all my future episodes as a host or a guest. Also, be sure to check out our favorite non-comedy shows in Laughable as well. Plus profiles for Mick Jagger, Anthony Kiedis, and thousands more entertainers and public figures. It's the best place for all your podcast listening. 
Android folks, Laughable is coming out for you this month, March. Get more details at laughable.com. Don't forget to follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. And for all things 500, go to our website, the 500 podcast.com. With that being said, here we go with number 483 out of 500 with entertainment by Gang of It's Karen Kilgariff, it's Karen Kilgariff, it's Karen Kilgariff, it's Karen Kilgariff. <laughs> Isn't that good? It was really good. So tell me, like, what did you grow up listening to? Um, Yacht Rock. I mean, that was my, that was when I... That's your jam? That was what was on in the car, always, when I was growing up. Your parents? Yeah. It was just local AM radio. Um, I'm 72. Um, you look fantastic. <laughs> thank you. A lot of creams, <laughs> different creams and sauces. Um, no, so it was like that, you know, a lot of Gord's Gold type of shit in the background of all of my childhood. So yeah. that's a, definitely a go-to. Um, I just loved it. It was like all those songs were so good. But then I tried to get hip. Like I lived in a small kind of farm town. You're from Petaluma. Petaluma, yes, I do remember that. Yeah, yes. yeah. So it's um, it's cool now. It's very hip now, but at the time it was just small and farmy. So my dream was always like, what what are the cool kids listening to, or what are people listening to um, in the movies or whatever. Sure. Uh, so there was a radio station um, uh, called Live 105 that was in San Francisco that was FM that we, I didn't get when I lived out, we lived like five miles out of town. But then when I was a sophomore in high school, we moved into town. Mm -hmm. And so I could get it really faintly. And I would listen to like almost entirely radio static, but with like a tiny bit of the cure or underneath. Or like, something <laughs> happens <laughs> and I'm head over heels, I never head over. <laughs> and I'm laying on my bed crying. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it was like. It was just, but it was a little more distant it was like it was out on a ship or something and you felt cool and because felt, it was yes. just yeah magical because back then no internet you had to get like good bands find out about good music from other people yes and you had to know cool people you had to know someone with an older brother in college basically to find out about good music sure that's how it happened for us because i was it was all acdc and bad company growing up because it was older sisters music and then basically when I was in high school, that's when it was like, it's about those college age dudes that are like music snobs. We yeah. have to find out what they're listening to because that's where that's where the action is. I think that's this this album is all about that guy's music taste. Oh, completely. All right. So let's so, so you had you ever heard of Gang of Four like prior to this? No, I thought when you asked me about this, that we were doing Gangstar. And, really? I, and, and I was like, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, I, I, I've heard of them. I can't say I'm a fan, but I'm, I would love to get into it. And then when I looked it up, I was like, oh, this isn't, this isn't. Gangstar was white? The <laughs> and British. And British. What the fuck? Gangstar was post-punk? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I saw that album cover. And that album cover is like the coolest that's what being cool looked like in 1984. Oh, completely. Completely. Uh, except from 79, right? When the album came out? Yeah, it came out in 1979, September 25th. Let's, all right, so let's just dive into it, okay? Okay. okay? Our album is number 483 out of 500. It's the debut album, Entertainment by Gang of Four. Like I said, released September 25th, 1979, two months before my birthday, <laughs> produced by Andy Gill, John King, and Rob War, recorded at the warehouse, Old Kent Road, London. All right, and like you mentioned, post punk. I had never heard of this band. I, I at had all. maybe like I okay. saw it on the list, and I was like, "All right." And I, and I, but you know what's funny is that I was expecting. Um, I never expected Rage Against the Machine took a huge influence from this. I never yeah. would have expected like Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, REM. I was expecting like very like eighties like oh 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 and you're coming down. I said oh 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 and the Love Machine. That's what I expected. 
<laughs> so and so I was completely blown away when I first heard this. At first it was, it was a little rough, and then I, as soon as I started reading more and getting into it. So, so tell me your first initial thoughts when you listen to this record. Very first thought was, this is that music that's playing faintly in the background during 16 Candles, where that where it's like, why isn't this on the soundtrack? Yeah. I, that, I spent that entire movie going, what, what about that song? <laughs> that that's not on the soundtrack. And that's, so that's, it's kind of that feeling of like that distant coolness that you cannot find out about. Yeah. So that's the first kind of feeling that it had. And that um, it felt like this is the band bands loved that then went on to you know, basically be on the soundtrack for 16 Candles. But these guys were the ones that gave everybody the idea. Like you got, to me, it has that feeling where (laughs) we were joking about it. Like anytime I hear the lyric down on the street, you know, it's like those people that are like, fuck, (laughs) fuck publicity and fuck the man and fuck getting famous. Like they probably fought any popularity that they had at all. And so they seem like the kind of band that would turn their backs on the audience during their shows. Just to do it. Oh, well, first of all, oh. you know, we can speak of that because <laughs> let's not forget, people. All right. Listen, Fleece Army. This is, let me tell you something. So, so I told Karen, this is the album that you want to do. She was like, yeah, I love discovering new music. That's great. We'll do it together. Perfect. <laughs> then I was like, holy shit. Gang of Four is playing at the Roxy. And I do the goddamn comedy jam at the Roxy. And I was like, you know what? I can get us tickets. Let's completely go. And you were like, and then your exact text back was, let's do it. I like to be comprehensive. And I was like, fuck yeah. She's into it. Let's fucking do it. And then here's the funniest shit is that I told you and then I told Matt Pinfield. Then my friend Morty, who does the research on the record with me, he's like, dude, I got to come. And then I'm like, this is going to be great. And I hit up Molly at the Roxy. Big shout out to Molly. She's like, I got you, Josh. I'll take care of everybody. (laughs) Then the day came and I had this huge audition in the morning and I was completely exhausted and I wanted to cancel, but I was like, I can't (laughs) because Karen's going. She's excited. I was like, this is going to be great. And then an hour before the show... (laughs) Keystone Karen hits me up and she's like, Petaluma's own. <laughs> Karen Kilgariff says, The pride of Petaluma is here. The pride of can't... Petaluma. What? I'm the worst. I'm the worst. But I... you you just come back. Go ahead. It's fine. Oh, we you... were, well, I went into the polar vortex and we were on the road for uh, six days. And then, so this was the day after we got home. So we, Josh and I had this conversation while I was yeah. on the road, the loneliest place in the world. Oh, so, I can imagine. So yeah, I know. What you it's like. saying that, you being like this and that. And I'm like, oh, when I get back, I'm going to have a life and I'm going to live that life. <laughs> like it was so exciting to me. I love it. was like the new Karen who does things yeah. and goes places <laughs> and has plans. And the fucking, I mean, all day that day, I was like, okay, we'll just nap now. You can just nap, nap it off, and then you'll, off. then you'll be fine for the night. And that nap just kept on going. Or be like four o'clock, five o'clock. And I'm nap like, it off no, sounds you- like the song that that I thought Gang of Four would make. Like <laughs> nap it off, oh, 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 we're gonna nap it, nap it off. Nap it off. Uh, come on, nap it <laughs> off, yeah. So you were gonna nap. I was gonna nap it off and it just stretched where I was like, and then this is the worst part about, it's just being old (laughs) and not drinking anymore. Oh yeah, I get it. It's standing, like I just pictured myself standing in the Roxy and the amount of like incredible depression that like waved over me. I'm like, I I can't do it anymore. I get it. I'm, I, but then you did send me. Okay, well, no, no, no. I'll tell you what you missed. Don't tell tell them. I will tell them because I experienced (laughs) I I'm experienced. Just glad that you weren't so mad you weren't talking. No, to no, me. God, no. I'm not upset at all. <laughs> I would have canceled. That was the thing. I wanted to cancel. I wanted to cancel first. I 100% wanted to cancel, but I had too many people. Yeah. So let me tell you what the fuck happened. So you wouldn't have been standing <laughs> oh. because of Molly. And I have that show there, and I never asked for tickets. Dude, complete VIP. I mean, she was waiting for me out front, and she goes, Is everybody here? And I was like, Yeah, everybody's here. She goes, Where's Karen? And I go, <gasps> Oh, yeah, she, uh, She's tired. <laughs> She's tired. Oh, yeah. no. And then, and then she lets us in this back door entrance to the exclusive VIP area <laughs> where we have our own booth with Shepherd's Ferry, the, the fucking the artist, open, the artist yeah. one of the most influential artists of the last 20 years, and Tom Marillo <laughs> from Rage Against the Machine. 
<laughs> and a cake with your face and on I it, had Karen. The cake with the cake said, "Welcome back, Karen. You haven't been here in a while. <laughs> you <laughs> sober bitch, like fucking the Roxy, Mrs. Drunk Karen. Like, where is Drunk Karen? <laughs> and and then it was like the show starts, and and let me tell you, first of all, I I had already met Tom Rillo before and Shepard. Uh, I had seen just you know his artwork, so of course I knew of him, but to see. The way that Tom Murillo was rocking out to Gang of Four was, I mean, just like it was so you could you could just see that it was that little kid that grew up with this band. The the show was it was literally Andy Gill, the guitarist, which is the picture that I sent you. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> and now three 20 year old, very, very talented British musicians, right? So it's really Gang of One now. Yes. Uh, and he opened with the final song on the album, uh, Love is Like Anthrax. Yeah. Which is literally just noise at the beginning in the guitar. You were talking about how they don't care. Dude, this motherfucker <laughs> does not care. So he walks out, the bassist is playing that. Dude, fucking Peter, play that bass line for a second. That It's just like. Boo -doo 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 -doo. And then he's fucking moving. The bassist is playing. And Andy picks up a guitar, starts hitting it, and then starts throwing the guitar around the stage. With his hands in his pocket, he starts kicking the strings. Like, literally, <laughs> fuck you, I don't care about any of this shit. And, and then, like, they go into the song. And they did. Uh, the set was incredible. And, uh, you know, there were some songs. They played some new songs, which was cool. But they played, like, Damaged Goods. Uh, they played uh, At Home, He's a Tourist, which <laughs> was was one of my favorite songs off the record. And uh, it was a great show. And then after the show, because you were like, we should meet the band. <laughs> remember that verbatim? Remember, you said, remember. We're, remember, remember when you said, we're going to go, we're tour busing it. We're going on the tour <laughs> bus. Right. I'll check the goddamn text. That's I'll show right. everybody. She's like, we're going. And That's my great fantasy is going to see your favorite band fine. Get on that bus. Right? That's like, that's the true Valhalla. People are like, I want to get backstage. No, no, no. Backstage is just for, it's for the losers and the hangers on. Get on the bus. That means you made friends with people. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I, I lived our fantasy. That's what I did. You Sweetheart. went there. I went there. <laughs> I wasn't going to because I was like, eh, it's, it's just one guy. And then Morty goes, dude, you've got to, you've got to go meet the band, dude. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. So <laughs> I walk upstairs and, and there he is. Fucking Andy Gill with his three British guys that I that I've they're fucking literally like 21, 22 years old, right? Andy Gill sitting on the couch, just looking pissed off. And I walk in and I go, "Hey, I I'm so sorry to bother you guys. Uh, I do this podcast. I'm about to break down your record. I was uh, I'm doing it with Karen Kilgariff. You might know her from My Favorite Murder. She was supposed to come, but yeah, she's tired. She, did she didn't want to stand." She's incredibly lazy. <laughs> she's incredibly lazy. She was in the cold, and you know what it's like being out on the road. I mean. You know, it's it's different. Comedians, it's far harder than you in all the bouncing around you do on stage. You wouldn't understand. You wouldn't get it. So I, <laughs> so I just I look at the young guys and I go, I go, you guys were fantastic. And then I look right at Andy and I go, but you, you are a fucking genius, man. I was like, there are no other bands without you. There's no Rage Against the Machine. I can hear that in At Home, I'm a Tourist, the way it kicks in. I can hear Red Hot Chili Peppers in, in the second song off of the record fucking called <laughs> Natural's Not In It. I was like... I was like, and then there's those bands that blatantly ripped you off. Fucking Block Party, Interpol, Franz Ferdinand, all those like, you know, post-punk fucking, you know, mid-90s band that I used to dance to at Taxlow in Baltimore. <laughs> and I was just like, I love you, man. You're a fucking genius. And then he smiled just a little bit. Oh. And the first thing he says, he goes, where's Karen? <laughs> 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 and I was like, she didn't make She's tired, dude. I'm sorry. She's so tired. She's so tired. He goes, uh, and then I took a picture with sorry, him. Sorry, Andy. Yeah. He <laughs> didn't smile or anything. He looked so pissed in that picture. It made me laugh so hard because I, of course, was like in my same 19-hour position that I was laying in. Yeah. And then that picture comes where you, it looks like you're just completely bawling like, yeah, what's up? But then the, it's like, it looks like you sat down next to a guy at Starbucks and we're just like, <laughs> click, don't worry about it. Click, click. Like, that guy looks, he does not look like the, you know, the bleed guitarist of the coolest band ever he yeah. looked like a pissed british guy yeah it and, was awesome and so then to follow this up the story actually is a part two which is i go to see kiss uh at the whiskey on uh the, just yesterday it was on monday and i'm up in the vip because i <laughs> snuck in 
and everybody's at the fucking Kiss concert, man. It's it's like you see, uh, uh, dude, LL Cool J was there. Nice. Gary Delabate from Stern, uh, Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains, Rob Zombie, and then just assorted like many many rock stars and diehard Kiss fans. And Tom Morello did the intro for Kiss. And now at this point, this is the third time I met him, and I hung out with him at the Gang of Four concert. And he's sitting at a booth. And I walk up to him and I just go, hey, man, uh, do you mind if I ask you a quote? You know, we met and he's like, yeah, yeah, I saw you at Gang of Four. And I go, dude, I go, how? I do this podcast and I'm about to break down Gang of Four. I say to him, how influential was Andy Gill as a guitarist on you? And I'm talking like his eyes lit up. Uh And then he was just like, there is no Rage Against the Machine without Andy Gill. Whereas I used to play the guitar to for people to think how cool I was and the noises I did. Andy Gill didn't give a fuck. Yeah. You would listen to a song. And I mean, tell me if you thought this because this is what I broke was that. It's like there are songs that you're like, okay, here's the bass, here's the drums, here's the singer, and what the fuck is the guitarist doing? It's like it seemed at parts like they were all doing separate things. I was also blow my mind was blown. Yeah, because the guitar is almost like feels argumentative. It's not going along with anything. And it's it's certainly not like it, it doesn't go like it's not like a flow in any way. It's like eh. It's like someone poking you in the ribs. Yeah. But that fucking drummer, I don't know what his name is offhand. That guy was working overtime because he's like that, that kind of drumming. I don't know. It's so fast. It's amazing. He has to do all different kinds of styles. Like there's that one song that's like almost like Tom Tom, you know what I mean? It's like tribal beat. Well, his drums throughout the whole album, him and the bass are... It's like I mentioned Red Hot Chili Peppers. The the bass line is like the star of the melody, the star that's really pushing the song forward. And then Andy Gill is like playing off notes and he's playing like almost like 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 Tom Murillo said that it's almost like an entirely different song. Yes. But it's so it was so new. There was nobody doing that. My friend Morty wrote this whole thing. It's like it's it, his Preceded by releases by angular minimalist punky bands like Television and Wire, Gang of Four's entertainment marched onto the scene with a Marxist philosophizing. That is the other thing. Yes, they are. The lyrics are. I mean, it's they're they're it's a it's it's against capitalism. Uh, they're they're talking about you know communism. They're talking about assassination. It's like <laughs> they're Marxists. Like they fucking love rich, you know. I was back on Richard Marx. What? <laughs> they well, love, you mean Richard Marx? Richard Marx is very Marxist. What was, that, actually. What was a Richard Marx? Song? Hold on to the. <laughs> Hold on to the. <laughs> They're all Play that shit, Peter. A little bit like that. Um, well, I think also they were doing that thing because obviously post punk was like punk was yeah, fuck you three four whatever. They basically so then it's like post punk where there it's like. We're going to kind of put some keyboards in. We're going to maybe act like we're from Germany. This is all going to get a little bit smarter and slicker and cooler, but we're going to still keep the fuck you punk part in it. And we're not just going to say fuck the queen. We're going to be like, the things you buy are creating the unhappiness in the, you know, like really specific. Yeah. So it's not just political fuck you bratty teenage shit. This is like grad school shit. Oh, a hundred percent. This is grad school shit. And it makes me feel like I'm not qualified to listen to it because the second anyone's talking about as i said to you down in the street or what's happening with the people i'm always like oh i don't i didn't take this class <laughs> like, i didn't ma- i didn't major in this i'm in a private plane right now i, don't, I mean <laughs> you know i'm I'm, I'm, to, t- I'm so tired i'm like, tired I'm so of learning tired from, i can't take in new information <laughs> um but so let's let's get into the record and and let's let's break it down let's all break right it down. let's break it down just like all right so it starts with ether and and i like i said i wasn't expecting this at all um just the the clashing of the guitars is almost unnerving uh and then the ending peter play where it goes i think it's minute 247 that build up until it kicks in because this is one of my favorite parts of the entire record At this point, you know, you're getting to an end and you get one of the first uh, chants where they're screaming, there may be oil, uh, (laughs) which I wasn't expecting. All right. So 
while the lead vocals present this point of view uh, about the British consumer and military aggressor, the juxtaposed response <laughs> after each line represents the IRA. So this is a political song about how Ireland wanted their independence, okay? And the British were like, no. So every time the, the line came from a British perspective, the first line, and that, that call and response, you know, was basically Ireland's response about wanting to break through this whole fucking, I, I don't know the entire situation, but I assume they'd been fighting. I saw the movie. It the, was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. I saw the movie, <laughs> The Crying Game. But here's, here's some of the sample lyrics. Dig at the root of the problem, fly the flag on foreign soil. So that's the Irish response. It breaks your new dreams daily, British. Uh, H block long cash. No idea what the fuck that means. <laughs> Father's contradictions is British. Then you have Ireland saying censor six countries new or censor six counties news. And then British and breaks your new dreams daily. And you have Irish response each day more deaths. I mean, and this is a danceable <laughs> song. Yes. Um, so there's as, nothing in it when you first listen to it that uh, like if you didn't tell me this right now and I've listened to this song, I'd say f f 10 times at this point. It never did anything political come into mind. Because, for the song? For the song. I, I think it's because they don't. The lyric, the only lyrics that stand out to me were like the uh, there might be oil thing at the end where then I'm just like, I don't even know what they're saying. It almost doesn't it isn't any of my business because yeah. what's happening is like for me, that song is not has no political feeling. It really and this whole album, my my kind of phony theory is this is what doing cocaine feels like. Really? And, yes. You've never done cocaine? No, no, no. I've done right, a ton okay, of cool. cocaine. Okay, it's, yeah. That's why I'm saying it. <laughs> it's This is the feeling. So this song kicks it off. I'm always wondering if there's oil around when I'm high on coke. <laughs> no, there may it, be oil. There may be oil in there. It's like, like <laughs> bullshit oh, yeah. people say when they just need to talk. And yes. like, so it's a thing where there's this driving, exciting feeling. There's this kind of like, na, 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 You know, it's like, it won't leave you alone. And it's kind of exciting, but you don't know why. And you kind of don't know what's going on. And then there's like just a bunch of shouting at the end. Yeah. And like with each song that goes on, then there's like a paranoia part. And like, it was, it's just a theory. But to me, it's that kind of like, at the time, I think like that's kind of what people are doing they were answering that this isn't stony music in the least this isn't like at all this isn't get high smoke a joint and i mean this is like this is the music you would listen to if you were about to get ready to go protest yeah you know what i mean it's yes. like it's like all right you got the sign ready there may be oil <laughs> it's tough dude all right so getting to the bottom of ether it's about the british and the irish uh conflict now as the song also takes a strong position on torture White noise in a white room, which is very fucking, this is heavy as fuck. The song also could also display a conscious. Yeah. A conscience? We, a conscience. Thank you. Yeah. So we all have a little voice in our head, basically cr contradicting our best plans. Okay. <laughs> yes, how we does, do. How does yours torture you? Um... It does things like, I really want to go to the Roxy and it won't let me go. I'm not kidding. I mean, that that's such a good example of it where um, m the voice in my head is very um, low key. It's not overtly mean. It's very convincing. And it's yeah. just kind of quiet. Yeah. And it's like, you can't, don't go. You won't. You won't. It's not going to work out. It won't be good. And, that's, and it's really um, hard to ignore because it's very... Uh, subtle as opposed to like shut up oh my god I don't have to listen to that terrible voice it's like it almost doesn't seem like a voice it's just like the the truth sure you know? I, I have a I have a big issue with my ego that's one of the things I've been trying to kill over the last year which is my ego used to create wars with people that didn't exist <laughs> yeah. and I'd go and especially in our in, in our business the entertainment industry I was like I'd be I'd be excited. It's a friend's birthday. I'm gonna see all these people, and then that voice comes in. Yeah, but that person doesn't like you, and this person is out to get you, and this person's <laughs> here to destroy you. It yeah. has been literally uh, this full year of being able to separate myself from that voice. Yes. Um, have you had any? Because you actually gave the perfect example. Was there a <laughs> moment in your career where you had to fight that voice? <clears throat> oh, the, I've had to fight it the whole time. I mean, uh. 
it's I I also have uh, I'm a huge addict and have all those all those things they describe. Um, I sorry I shouldn't have said it like no I'm no no also, um, but basically uh, for for as good as I feel for as much as like love comedy think I can do comedy and want to do comedy there's an equally powerful thing in me that's like you can't and you're gonna fail every single time so every time I did it it was like a terrible boxing match just to get on stage and it's been like and I think that's why I used to self-medicate so much is because I I felt like I put myself in that position I had to do this thing that I didn't actually want to do that was very painful and emotional to do and then but so then it would have to be like it would be like if I didn't kill it was abject failure yeah so it's just I mean it's been like that the whole time has there been a time that the voice was its loudest like really holding you back I mean has it been you know because you've been you've worked with some of the most incredible people you know in entertainment I mean the first time I remember seeing you was Mr. Show with Bob and David yeah. which to me is one of the greatest collection of of, of, of sketch writers and sketch actors and just all of you. It was such an impressive, impressionable show on me. Um, I mean, so was that hard at the beginning or did it, did the voice grow over time as the success started coming in? Uh, I think it grew, uh, um, like I was able to mute it out in the beginning a little bit better when I could just be blackout drunk all, all the time. Yeah. That's, that helps. Uh, <laughs> oh, I know. I was, it's fentanyl awful. works as well. Fentanyl. <laughs> We'll fucking shut that voice down <laughs> all together. Yeah. Then you then you just have nothing in there. Fuck dude. Um speed doesn't help that voice. Speed speed makes the voice more intense. Yep. Uh yeah. Cocaine made me especially like at like the at like the real like if I went over a night into the next day and I was like, Well, I got shit to do. I gotta fucking do it. Just do more coke. And then it's like complete I remember when I was I was at PA on uh, keeping up with the Kardashians. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, it stayed up all night doing coke, and then I'd have to go like get lunches for you know, for get Chris that Jenner. Salad, I'd be like, special. oh, I'd be like, Chris Jenner hates me. Chris <laughs> Jenner is trying to destroy me. That fucking bitch. That fucking bitch. Hold on, it's, all right. Now I'm getting. Yeah. God bless it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. So, I I think drugs make the voices terrible and more convincing. I think sobriety makes them much more um, almost like omnipresent. And then the work is that you go, hey, you're fine. You don't have to, you're fine. Let's all relax and not have to react to everything. But I mean, yeah, I think... I think performing brings it out in me more that when I started writing more, I was like, this is the best. I don't, then I can just hide in this office. I don't have to talk to anybody and I can just do it. It's a, v- a very solitary thing. Yeah, completely. So it's the vulnerability. I think anytime I have to be vulnerable, it's it goes crazy. I, I No, I completely understand that 100%. Um, then the song, then the album goes into Naturals Not In It. Um which is I, if the first time I heard it, I was like, "This is a blatant, like Red Hot Chili Peppers blatantly <laughs> ripped off this song for the song Can't Stop." Peter, play the the intro to uh, "Naturals Not in It." Just play the beginning to it. All right, now, Peter, play the beginning to Can't Stop by Red Hot Chili Peppers. hear it though yes it's it's literally like uh like they completely stole the the just they just even the way that like the verse goes the singing style um sample lyrics uh the problem of leisure what to do for pleasure <laughs> i mean this is what i love about this they get in one of the, they have another chant go to the chant at uh, minute one second 51 
Repackaged sex keeps your interest over and over. And then probably one of my favorite parts, uh, this heaven gives me <laughs> migraine, migraine. I love British people so much. You know what I mean? <laughs> you pointed that out before I heard it. And then when it came up in the song, I laughed so hard. And also just that whole line, this heaven gives me migraine is like so that time. Yeah. It's just like we don't like sex and we don't like things we like and everything is bad. It's like every like even the, the love songs on this aren't. Oh, it's just like it's I thought I loved you, but it's lust. It's all those. You know what I mean? They just don't ever do it. So so while like. All right. So there's a lot of punk that that strives to rebel against the bloated rock star pretensions of their day. And many of them, uh, many of these songs take a take a look uh, at the spa, sparse, jarring, big guitar riffs of earlier. But groups like the Kinks and the Who basically did all of that. Now, while a lot of those groups have songs about cool stuff uh, that what they wanted and what they what they were hoping to get, there this is this is a love song using Marxist and situationalist <laughs> rhetoric to tie all of this together. Because the song is basically about commodifying romantic and sexual relationships. Uh, so they're almost like saying that, that sex is like a transactional, like it's like it's, there's a transactional quality of, like, uh, of just comparing these two things. Yes. So let me ask you this. What's your take on the <laughs> politics of dating and relationships and what has given you a migraine? <laughs> um, God, so many things. Uh, I think these days, I, I mean, I, I can't say I'm like a big dater these days. I, it seems horrifying to yeah. me. Um, I don't understand how people, I mean, I, I get that it's just the way it is, but dating online like using apps to date is the most baffling thing to me i've like watching my friends do you know bumble or or tinder or whatever where it's just like so you're picking a guy based on his shirt or based on whatever rock he's leaning up against but like if you're at a party that's not how you do it that like you can talk to a person who you think at the beginning of the party is really good looking and two seconds into the conversation you're like whoops yeah that the you know that's not right yeah and you move on and then the person you pick is the person you never noticed when you walked in the door the person you end up with sure and that to me it's like how do you find people on online dating that you know i feel like gang of four could do an amazing song about that the, that's like the commodification of attraction of kind of like saying well you have to look like this to get this type of looking person but sure. it has nothing to do with knowing each other or or even like just chem chemistry, like not chemistry is yeah. out entirely these days. Uh, I, I listen, man, I, I'm no better than anybody. So to, to make a, somebody go, you're not, I, you're not worthy. Swipe left or whatever it is. <laughs> yes. Like, I don't want to be, I makes me feel horrific. But have you, I, I, my friend had it up one time and I'm like, this is so disgusting. And I was like trying to yell at her about it. And she goes, will you just do a couple for me? And literally within 45 seconds, I was going like, ew, what? No. And I yeah. turned into the person that I was judging immediately because that's the whole, that's the game of it. And who doesn't love it? It makes you feel so good if you can be the one dismissing or the one that's so in control. Oh, but I think ultimately it's not like, I mean, hope I know people that have met and it's all worked out great, but I mean, I don't think that's really what it's for. So I think politically, I think it's just a drier time in terms of actual connection. Yeah. And it's much, it's much more, um, it's just about hooking up. I think. I think so too. Uh, what is the worst date you've ever been on? <laughs> the worst. Um, that is easy. It was, I was really thrilled because the way he asked was so awesome. He showed up at my friend's birthday party, stood in the back of the bar. I noticed he was there. I got excited. He came over, asked me out and left. He came there just to ask me out. Wow. It was fucking so baller. It must have been love, <laughs> but it's over now. It was very, uh, so that in and of itself, I was kind of like, okay, I'm I'm in for whatever. Oh, that yeah, dude, that that's that's hot, dude. That's it's, really hot. It, it was such a baller move. So, the actual date, he came to pick me up, but he didn't buzz my buzzer. Someone let him in the front door, so he was at my front door. And this, um, I lived in a studio apartment where literally it was like paths cut out of 
laundry to like a path to the TV, a, pa- a path yeah. to the bed and everything else was just disaster. It was like okay. chaos. So then he was at my front door where I was like, oh, I don't want you to come into my house. <laughs> like, and, but he did because he was like, oh, what's going on? And, and he basically just kind of came in where I was like, well, no, let's go. Let's not be in here. Um, so we go downstairs and his car. And now I swear to you, I'm not like the, superficial. Uh, <laughs> Is that what you're saying? I'm only was... lazy. That's my only flaw. I don't doubt that. Um, I, I, listen, you're beautiful. You're a beautiful soul, man. I love you to death. Um, we get to his car and I go, hey, is that your car? Because it was such a shitty car that I was joking. And it was his car. Do you remember what it was? Yes. It was. It was this. It was a um, like a red. It was like an old Honda, like stick shift, four door, like a early 80s red faded um the the uh i want to say roof what am i trying to hood the hood was primer gray yeah like like there had been a problem then he, he spray painted over it and then on top of the primer gray he spray painted my poopy car oh god and then he, and he was like <laughs> go ahead and get in i was just like i no, I can't get it. I was like, I'm I, not getting in a car. This is my poopy car. I thought this car was abandoned. First of all, <laughs> secondly, yeah, no, this okay. like, and it, from there it was just a lot of uncomfortable. I just was uncomfortable in this way where I kind of was like, um, it just wasn't. It didn't feel like fun conversation. It felt like a presentation that whether I was there or not, it was going to be happening. I get it. Um, I offered to split the tab and he was like, awesome. And then I was just like, oh man. Like it was just things like that where I, you know, whatever. No, I get it. I get it. But at the end, so then I was just like, thanks so much. Like trying to wrap it down. He's like, no, I want to take you to dessert at a different place. And by the end of the dessert, we were walking out to his car and he, what was the word? He called me a, he said, you're a real, um, fuck. Well, you're a real squiggly diggly. <laughs> what? You're, no, it you're was, a real um, kachunka slider. What is this? What are you saying? That's not an insult. That's <laughs> gibberish. No, no. It was not a shrew. Um, it was like a word like that for like a bitchy woman, but it was like an old fashioned word. It was like he was. I can't remember what I know, it was. I, I, I have an idea of what it is, but I can't say it. It's like, I'm not saying it's, I'm like, it's like offensive. I no, just, no. You know, did he call you a dame or some shit? <laughs> no, no, no. It was, it was like um, a shrew or it, it, the idea of it was like. It's like using like biblical terms <laughs> or some was, shit. You get in, you get in my car, you Jezebel. <laughs> you Jezebel. It, whatever it was. You eat this fig. That's <laughs> <laughs> all I eat is biblical fruit. <laughs> <laughs> but my thing was like, I was like, yeah, we didn't have to get to the point where you felt the need to call me this. I tried to leave earlier and you literally wouldn't let me. That goes into Not Great Men. Speaking of, wow, what a fucking the great. Song? Yeah, the song is called Not Great Men. Amazing. They're three for three on openings for this song. Peter, play the opening because I fucking love this song. The bass, the drums are driving this song, and the guitar is so catchy. Uh, and like we were talking about, Andy Gill's style of playing, everything that he's playing feels offbeat. Uh, sample lyrics, the past lives on in your front room, the poor still weak, the rich still rule, history lives in the books at home, the books at home. And then, then of course, the chant, it's not made by great men. Now... Winston Churchill said, history is written by the victors. The song seems to go even further by tearing down all of the winners who got their names in the history books. And I guess this also scores a hit against sexism as well, as many fields that you've succeeded in have also been dominated by men by design. Um, Do you have any times where there were clashes with sexism and that you had to deal with in your career field? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's... Especially, well, show business. It's, in general, it's, yeah. It's um, mostly men in power. That's changing now, which is awesome. Um, I think for the most part, it's been in times where I was uh, like a uh, higher level, like being a head writer, being a manager or something, or being running a show in some way. And the when people can't listen to you, you like there have been times where I just tell a guy to tell somebody something because they yeah. can't hear it from a woman. And that's not... Um, 
sometimes I don't even think that's malicious or or intentional in any way. It's 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 the way some people were raised where they can't trust a woman uh, what a woman is saying. Like yeah. they they don't something happen to them or or they don't have the experience. They they've never worked with somebody who knows better than them that's also a woman. So it's like a weird daddy complex, but I can't tell you how many times if there is a taller a person in the room, like the tallest man in the room is the person that some people will listen to. Even it doesn't matter if that person's a PA or or in charge. That's it's like you're get, like I'm the showrunner. <laughs> yeah. This money, this guy's just dropping off the pizzas. <laughs> yeah, for real, it happens. But but I think that's the kind of thing where it's just like you can't take it personally and you can't let it get in your way. Yeah, completely. You know? Was there a time that it's it's gotten like hard for you in particular that any any situation like that where it just really stuck out? Well, when I when I was learning to manage writers cuz like my first head writing job, I'd only had two staff writing jobs before that, so I was in a panic the entire time. Um, and managing it's a lot of responsibility, especially yeah. to be the head guy. And, yes. it, and there, there's, there's millions of dollars behind the project that exactly. I can imagine. So much pressure. And also when you're fucking it up, you know, you're fucking it up, but you don't know like why or what to do. Like if you don't know what to do, then you don't know what you don't know how to fix the thing you fucked up. Yeah. Um, so there was just a lot of like learning, like in, you know, like learning in public day to day fucking up and having to learning to apologize, learning to be like, okay, this is how it actually goes and earning basically earning the knowledge, like the hardest way possible. Um, but yeah, I think, I think after a while you just is when, as a woman in that position, you just learn what the pitfalls are and you learn how to get around them. Like you just start anticipating things and then that's how you, um, don't, that's how you end up succeeding in the face of it is yeah. that you actually keep your eyes open and instead of being like, this is wrong and I'm going to be mad about it. It's like that. Well, that's how that person is. Like you can't generalize. You have to learn from it. You have to, you just have to kind of get smarter and then you really do get smarter, which Completely. is, which is only good. Completely. Well, just to lighten it up, um, who were some female <laughs> heroes in your life or, or ones that you didn't even know were your heroes, but this that helped you guide through situations like that. Professional situations, whatever. Um, well, my mom, my mom was a psychiatric nurse. She was the head nurse at a mental hospital. So, (laughs) right. So she had her whole style. I didn't, I was, we fought a lot when I was growing up, but I realize now I completely am just mostly doing an impression of my mom all the time. And she was really like fair and, uh, she was very in tuned, you know, she, she was all about mental illness and about why people do the things they do. And, um, she was really hilarious about just analyzing people from a distance. So she'd be like, Oh, he's such a sociopath. So it wouldn't be like, <laughs> Oh my God, that man's trying to do something to me. It'd be like, that guy's a fucking sociopath. Sure. Stay away yeah, from yeah. him. You know? And it was, it was empowering in that way where you just kind of go like, everybody has their reasons and everybody has an agenda, including me. And so mine isn't more important or, you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't be mad at somebody else for having an agenda when you do too. And so if there's wins over yours, so be it, get back up and do something else. Um, I think I just, she basically implanted that in me without me knowing it. So then I weirdly had these tools without any training. Yeah. Thank, Thank fucking God for Pat Kilgariff because they were just, it was from listening to her my whole life. Yeah. My mom, uh, you know, my mom, that's one thing that I've had to cut out that my mom implanted on me. My mom always (laughs) like, she says too much. If you say, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's great weather out today. She's like, Oh, it's fantastic because I have a slip disc in my back (laughs) and it's killing me right now. And I used to do that too, where it was just somebody would open the fucking, the, the window of a question, just like a simple question. And I would just give too much. And uh, so thanks mom for that. Cause you've, you've definitely made some conversations very awkward. I love this song. I, I do love this chant. Just it's not made by great men. Yes. It's this was one of the songs, man, if you would have been at that concert, <laughs> if you would have been there and seen Tom Murillo rocking out to this, like dude, he was full on like hip hop Eminem arm in the air. Like uh... doing the, it's not made by great men. <laughs> <laughs> it's not made by great men. Oh, 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 oh. 
The next song, Damaged Goods. Let's just get a little oh. listen to that. Do you, do, you want to, do you know this one? I love this song. The bass line on this song. It's just like the bass is such a star of this album. Yeah. And uh, it gets you right from the beginning. Uh, such a laid back chorus compared to the verses. Now go to a minute, one second, 45, when that kicks back in. Because it is fucking incredible. Then at like minute two, second 50, when it starts screaming, I'm kissing you goodbye, <laughs> it's such an incredible way to end the song. So you were saying this is one of the songs that stuck out to you? Yeah, because like it's it, um, it has such a, it does have a strong melody. And it isn't like, you know, when they're about, it, it, it feels like, oh, I can, I'm hearing a little bit of a like, this is about a relationship or this yeah. is about some something where I'm hooked in. The second I hear as we talked about the down on the street or the Marxism shit, I just go, oh, this song isn't for me. And I kind of wait around for the one where the lyrics are like, I kind of like you. And then I'm like, oh, what's this one? So that this has the poppiest to me. Really? Feel. No, of- this is when, this is definitely one of their poppier songs. Yeah. Mine is one that's coming up where I felt like that is the catchiest. This was, this was actually the first single by Gang of Four. This is the first one that was released. I hear a lot of Joy Division in it, mm. uh, which also might have been like the zeitgeist at the time. And once again, this is what a Marxist breakup song <laughs> sounds like. The song, again, turns love into another transaction. Yeah. Uh, you know, I love the, y'all sweat so sweet. Y'all sweat so sour. <laughs> It's 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 just they, they've really this is the most political breakup song I've ever heard. Now, <laughs> have you ever lost anything meaningful or expensive in a breakup? Mm. Or have you taken anything and thrown something away out of spite? <laughs> yes. What have you done? Um, God. Open up, girl. This uh, is it. Well, this is. Non relationship. I stole that guy's car. <laughs> <laughs> the doo doo mobile. What was I had it? it painted and then I returned it to him. <laughs> the doo doo mobile. <laughs> My poopy car. Oh, poopy. Yeah, that's even better. <laughs> um, when I left, I so I worked on a TV show for five years, and while I worked on it, I was given a car for Christmas one year. Really? As a, a I think very, I know which show that is. Yeah, very yeah. <laughs> very generous <laughs> gift, um, and it was it was. Um, a BMW coupe, a brand new, it was an amazing, I mean, I, she put a bow on the hood. It was amazing. Wow. And it was like one of those moments where you're like, I've made it in Hollywood, but I would drive this car around and it was the kind of car that like you step on the gas and nothing happens. And suddenly you're going 70 on Riverside and like you're, <laughs> you're going to kill a bunch of people. So, um, it was, it just made me feel different to drive that car. Cause it sure. was very like, yeah, what's up motherfucker. It's, you know, here I am in Hollywood with my BMW coupe. And when I left that show after the writer's strike, the first thing I did was trade that car in for a Honda fit. I just was like, I, that was never me. I didn't like the way it made me think about myself. Like I get it, it. it honestly made me think I was better than other people, I, I, which is the Hollywood trick. You know what I mean? And completely. it was just like, yeah, fuck you. Here's it's me and my BMW, which is just like, whatever. So I just, uh, that one, and it could have been for spite too, cause it was a bad ending, but it also was that thing of like, I just don't want to pretend, you know, I don't want to play that part anymore in, yeah. in any way. Um, and also it was cool. Cause then I didn't have to pay like, the trade-in was so good that I got money back. I know, they were probably like, <laughs> the fuck you doing? You, why can't, you, this, you really want this poopy car? I want it. I want to buy it. Yeah. Was there everything you ever, uh, you ever did out of spite in a breakup? I mean, I have like been, yes, a hundred percent. But I never, like, it wasn't a stealing thing. 
I definitely, I would just do a thing where it'd just be like, if I left it at your house, I never want to see it again yeah. type of stuff. Like entirely bailing on things or not letting people like come back and go, here's your shirt or, you know, that kind of shit where I'd be like, I, that's not my shirt. I don't care. And just like, that's the Irish death drop of like fucking it's when it's over, you no longer exist on this planet. I get it. Which I, tr I'm trying to work on now because I realize it's, you know, not healthy and just not realistic, but. Um, I don't recommend it. It's just harsh. You know, I would be less harsh if I could be, I, I guess is what is I'm saying. Is that the Irish you're saying? <laughs> it is. It is. Because I think we're so fucking repressed that any feeling at all, if like, if you make me have a feeling, I'm already mad at you. Like you brought this thing out of me that I can't control, that you somehow can control. There's all that element to it. So it's, it's bad enough to be vulnerable and then to be hurt or have it go badly. It's just like, all right. Let's just act like this never happened. Yeah. Is the only thing I can think to do. Fucking Irish people, dude. <laughs> Return the gift. It's probably the most straightforward chorus. Uh, the first straight chorus that's, uh, that to me sounds like a semi pop song. Uh, Peter, play a little of the verse into the chorus. And once again, it's another one line chant. Please, see, please send me evenings and weekends just over and over. Now, uh, I've, I've come to this conclusion that I think the band just runs out of lyrics yeah. and they just are like, let's just, let's just repeat this line over and over. First of all, it sounds like Andy Gill's guitar has been rudely intruding on the funky groove that's already <laughs> laid down uh, from the rhythm section of Dave Allen on bass and drummer Hugo Burnham. That's Hugo guy, Burnham, Her, that's my Hugo guy. Hugo Burnham. Surprise, surprise, this one appears to be about how workers are getting shafted in the <laughs> class struggle. This is a danceable proletariat song. I thought it was about going on vacation in Scotland. What is the worst job you've ever had? Oh, God, um, God, the first, the very first one that just popped into my head, and I haven't thought about it for in forever was Hit me. there uh, when the when the fair was in town in Petaluma. We had fair you were a carny. <laughs> <laughs> I ran the zipper. You did the zipper. <laughs> Y'all want to go faster? <laughs> yeah. While well, they're playing fucking like you know, cut my life into pieces. Y'all want to go faster? Yeah. yeah. She Machine. And then I go backward. Um, no, we had like family friends who sold like big bags of pe like peanuts by the pound, like salted peanuts in the shell it's and shit. Ridiculous. The and fuck's going on in Petaluma? Country honey, stuff. Honey, this this fucking van <laughs> broke down. I found found three tons of, <laughs> of of circus peanuts. <laughs> well, I'll rent a kiosk and let's get down <laughs> let's to the get, fair. Yeah, the carnies are back. Come on, I know them all. So we had to like stand around and make change. And then one night, and it was just like pretty basic, but it was just like, it was that kind of thing where like, do you want a handful of peanuts? That was pretty much all we were doing all day is just like sitting there trying not to eat the peanuts, dying of thirst under a red tent. Everything was like red. And at the end of the day, the family friend called my mom because the, um, the, uh, the money was off and they were like, did Karen take $12 or whatever? And I was so angry because I was like, First of all, I was standing next to you all day, and no, I didn't. I fucking... was eating peanuts. <laughs> My hands were busy. <laughs> we're busy breaking cracking. up those. Um, but yeah, it was like this weird, like no, I didn't, <laughs> and I'm never fucking doing that job again because it was like just so hot, so boring, so peanut based, and then I was accused of stealing at the end of it. All right, here's the next <laughs> song. All right, Guns Before Butter. Probably the greatest song title ever. Sure. So very punky vocally. This is when I go, drummers don't ever get enough credit because yeah. they're doing shit. Like they're doing four things when everyone else is doing their one thing. Oh, dude, it's, they're, they're moving. Their yeah. whole body's moving. Their whole everybody body. else is strumming. <laughs> uh, vocally, it sounds punky. What did you think about this song? Is this, you were saying, did you, this is one of the ones that stuck out to you? It, it sticks out. It makes me nervous. Like in my cocaine theory, this is the part where things start getting weird. It, this song kicks up and suddenly you don't trust your friends anymore is the feeling. It, it's like, um, which I think that's kind of what, what I like about this album. It sets this mood and it isn't chill and it isn't like cool. It's the mood it sets is like, I'm tense. Like, I think you could drive really fast through traffic with this album playing. And this song is to me the most um, 
like that where it's almost like let's go do something i do like this song a lot the guitar solo play the chorus until it kicks in in like two a minute two second 18 because it's so fucking good now here this is what this is about because i did the research guns <laughs> versus butter model is a macroeconomic term that simplifies how much of a country's gross domestic product i.e money will be spent on the military and how much on civilian goods yeah now it's worth noting, this is from Morty. I got to give it up for Morty because he fucking went out of his way to get some of this shit done. <laughs> In 1936, Nazi minister of propaganda, my favorite of all the Nazis was Joseph Goebbels. He said, I'm serious. <laughs> he said, we can do without butter, but despite all of our love and peace, not without arms. One cannot shoot with butter, but with guns. And then... Uh, what love and peace? He's uh, a Nazi. Yeah, I know, right? He's it's fucking like, talking all about All right, Joe. <laughs> Whatever, dude. Sure, Mr. Goebbels. Yeah, buddy. Then in 1976, which would have been fresh in the Gang of Four's mind, Margaret Thatcher said they put guns over butter, but we put almost everything over guns as her criticism and possible envy of Russia's disregard for anything but winning. All right, let's jump into my favorite song, one of my favorite songs. This was the one that got me right away. I found that essence rare. Mm. This was the first song on the album that stuck with me. The chorus is so fucking good. Uh, Peter, play a little bit of it. Oh, I might want to change my favorite to that one. But I look for the thing in 64 was a bikini. <laughs> and he rhymes bikini again. It's so good. Uh, but also, once again, uh, a very, very political song. Now, I found out because they mentioned bikini twice in this, okay? This is another fun fact <laughs> about this song. So, between 1964 and 1958, America detonated nuclear weapons they were testing in the arms race against Russia on and around the Bikini, bikini Island. Atoll, yeah. No, bikini Atoll, but literally Bikini Island. Yeah. Now, this is a really cool fact and why they put this in the song. When the bikini bathing suit was first introduced in 1946 in Paris, it was named after the detonations because that's what they thought the bathing suit would do to the public's mind. Yeah. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I had no idea. So the bikini is named after the island, and it was considered too risque for almost a decade. But then in the late 50s, it finally caught on in America to become all the rage and even influenced <laughs> the benign novelty song, Itsy Bitsy, Teeny Weeny, yeah. I love polka dot bikini. That the theme by the doo doo is got do. Which became a number one hit in 1960. So the song seems to tie some mindless consumerism in with the horror of what's actually out there. Mm. Like, in a way, they named this sexy ass swimsuit after the proposed devastation of millions of people. <laughs> and almost immediately, nobody cared because it was very sexy. What do you find sexy? What is sexy to you? Um, people who pay attention. Yeah. Like, it's a hard thing to do, and I definitely don't do it all the time. It's, uh, but I feel like you could look like anything. Or I should say this about, in my opinion, about men. You could, to me, you could look like anything. But if you are actually paying attention and doing that thing, and this is why I love comics, because comics do this all the time. It's kind of what you have to do to be a comic, which is you have to pay attention to what people are saying so you can, like, call some shit back and say, I'm listening to you and I know what you're talking yep. about. And, you know, when people do that in real life, it's such a compliment. And, and some you know, sometimes people don't give a shit um, to do that to you. But when they do, it's, to me, it's... it's um, it's exciting. It's like, because I'm, flirting creeps me out most of the time. Yeah. I just don't buy it. You know what I mean? I'm very cynical about shit like that. Sure. So if like no, someone's trying it. to be like, hey, I really like your thing. I'm just like, what are you trying to steal money out of my pocket? Is the first feeling I always get. So there's just a dip that um, paying attention in, in a specified way and not doing it to everybody, obviously. But yeah. Was I, there ever a time in your life where, where sex distracted you from from really the the realities no nah, i wouldn't that's not really how i am although when i was on speed 
<laughs> <laughs> that was that was kind of a like yeah. a weird side bar of it where it was like um I was much more um uh much more sexually active than I think I would have been normally because there was this kind of like, it's like you're trying to get out of your own skin feeling, yeah, you know? So, I get it. so you're just kind of like, you need to do something all the time. Yeah. Um, and it, and it was, it's funny because like, I think I also thought that would be kind of cool. And it's so funny. Like sex is actually very uncool. It's very it really like, is. it's very, it's very embarrassing and it's very human and it's very messy. And like the idea that people do that and that like to that goal where it's like, you basically want to go and get and like basically go into the messiest, most awkward situation that you can get into with a stranger. Like it's, it's the idea that anybody thinks that's going to be a good idea. (laughs) It's like so hilarious to me where it's like, it seems like you kind of should know that person a little bit or well in your in, I think when we're young like in our early 20s like that's very sexy it's just two young people just like you're exper- you know even if you've had sex a bunch it's just like you're experiencing it and you're just like oh my god this is so incredible i mean in my late 30s now it's just like it can be it could definitely be awkward but definitely early 20 sex over late 30 sex Oh, Fuck yeah. Always. And then 40 sex, let's not dis- even discuss it. I'll be there next year, baby. <laughs> Glass is the next song. Now, I didn't like this one at all. Mm. This is, all right, so this, you know what this song reminds me of? It reminds me of that song, uh, Incense Peppermints. <laughs> Incense Peppermints, ripples and time. <laughs> That's the way he's singing. Light myself up a cigarette. Yeah. Light myself, which is basically, uh, this is this is the same guitar lick from a song by The Birds called So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a song about dissatisfaction. Uh, cause you can hear it throughout the whole lyrics. It's like, I'm so restless, restless. I'm bored as a cat. We talk about this and we talk about that. <laughs> um, did you like the song or I do you have any notes? I, I mean, basically this was, I, as I was, um, thinking of this theory, cause I was just thinking of it today. I was like, I should have actually sat down and wrote up every single part of this for every song. But the light myself up a cigarette is like the classic cocaine moment where it's just like, I never smoked before and now I have to smoke. And it's that, and I need to smoke seven cigarettes in yeah. a row. It has, it has a bit of that, like the repetition and the ma- the manic feeling in it. Very manic. Um, which I like, this is like most of these songs to me have the feeling of, for me, it's aspirational 80s music. This is like, the guy, that what I picture is, it's like a John Cusack type of guy in like a, a grandpa Moss cardigan who's like walking down the street all pissy. And this is the soundtrack to that guy's life. Yeah. And it's that kind of like everybody, when I was a teenager and like in my 20s, everybody wanted to be that guy with like who hadn't gotten a haircut in a really long time and was wearing thrift store clothes. And that guy was the guy that if you said, I like Gang of Four, he would go name three of their albums right now. Oh, I hate that guy. I mean, that was the those were the only guys. Like that that was kind of how people were when I was coming up. Yeah. So you either didn't talk about it or you fucking did your homework so that you, they wouldn't throw your fucking Walkman into a ravine or what you know what I mean? Like you Did somebody throw your Walkman into a ravine? <laughs> no, that's how, that happened to some of you. Where in my do you town. live in Paris? Like <laughs> where are there ravines? <laughs> Gil Garrett spent those years in the Amsterdam fucking, what? you know, walking down Lienenspleen and fucking Damrak. You know a ravine is not a river. I don't know what a ravine is. I'm fucking an idiot. Like, what? I'm like, I'm thinking of a ravine as like the, like a canal, right? It's just kind of like a big ditch, really. Really? That's a ravine? Yeah. Oh, good enough. It's, I think it's like, yeah. But, but essentially... <laughs> You know, that I came up when bullying was like not just not allowed, it was fucking celebrated on a yeah. daily basis. So bullying was part of like, if you wanted to be cool or have a cool conversation, you had to bring all the information. You had to fucking like kn- have your own researcher, like know everything. And you couldn't just talk about music like, oh, I like this. I think it's interesting because those dudes would just be like, well, you were either wrong to like it you didn't know enough about it or what you really needed to do is listen to these four other bands because this is the fake version and these are the real versions. Sure. And to me, this band is the band they were always talking about. Oh, for sure. This is the real version. Yeah, and uh, this uh, leads us to uh, Contract. This is another song I didn't like. Not a bad song, just just really didn't dig it because it's literally comparing sex and politics again. <laughs> so I have a very lighthearted question for you. 
Uh, which, uh, <laughs> in the history of politics, if you had to fuck somebody, <laughs> who would you fuck? Fucking Abraham Lincoln. Really? <laughs> no, no. no okay. <laughs> I mean, um, he's long and tall. He's he, tall and skinny, which he, means huge Von Stucker. That's like, right. Uh, hair, <laughs> ha- hairless. No, he's definitely had a. He definitely had a unruly pubic hair. His pubic hair looked just like his beard, where it only went around the bottom. Um, I do like that he's very tall and very. St- I love a stern. Like I love a person that's that's all business all yeah, the time. His element's find- earth. His element is a hundred percent earth. Yes, he is, he's solid as a rock. And also, I don't understand it because I'm always so like, oh, what if we all do? You know what I mean? Like the <laughs> yes. nervous anxiety entertainment. Um, so I love a, a stoic son of a bitch. But <laughs> the first when you first started asking the question, this voice in my head started going, Dan Quayle, like insanely. But. I think it's just because that's when I was like 12 and he was, he was, he was attractive. He's not a bad looking guy. He's like, he looks like a weird, he looks like he's playing a teacher in an eighties movie. Sure. Like he's just, I could see him and definitely you can't mention mentioning John Hughes. I could see him in a John Hughes. I got you for two months. Two and two, buddy. (laughs) Two and two. (laughs) He is, he is exactly, he's like an old asshole. At home, he's a tourist. This is, one of uh, the songs that I said 100% reminds me of Rage Against the Machine. Um, Peter, I want you to play it from uh, 48 seconds in until this motherfucker kicks <laughs> in because this woke me up after two shitty songs. He fills his head with culture. He gives himself an ulcer. He fills his head with culture. He gives himself an When I met Tom Murillo, he imme- he literally said, "At home, he's a tourist." Is uh, is influenced him and his guitar playing, the way he wrote the verses and the choruses, the way it kicks in. Because once that shit kicks in, I immediately was like, "That's fucking rage." I love the chorus. Well, I love the verse first of all. At home, he feels like a tourist. He fills his head with culture. He gives himself an ulcer. <laughs> he fills his head with culture. He gives himself an ulcer. Just back and forth lyrics, and then that chorus. Down on the disco floor, they make their profit. For the things they sell to help you cob off, love British people, <laughs> and the rubbers you hide in your top left pocket, okay? Did you have any notes? This one, I, w- I was thinking, it's that very rare strand of music that they're like, we're a band because we want to make sure that you're not a total asshole for the rest of your life. Yes. Like, there are real things going on in this world, yes. and if this is the only way that you'll listen, then fine, we'll play these fucking songs for you. I love this. I love that you fucking get it, dude. God, if you just would have been there. <laughs> this is a traditional British story song, as it can be found on this album. Lyrically, this feels like the bridge between Ray Davis's kinks, decidedly English slice of life songs, and Damon Albarn's blur ones. Yeah. I really like that, Maury, because he saw it, and I completely agree with that. And once again, nobody is really happy, but everything is going through the motions of trying to occupy their time off work and their primal urges. What are some situations or times in your life where you were or just going, where you were just going through the motions? Um... All the times I've had high stress jobs, um, everything else in my life has been, I can only work is, yeah. is kind of, it's like the, uh, just another ism that it's like, if it's not this or that, then I'll just do the same thing with work. So I definitely like, if I've had high stress jobs, but then I show up to somebody's party, I'm just standing there. Like it's that, uh, I have a hard time. The work life balance is really hard for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's that. I definitely do that when I go to a, like, if I have to go socially, if I have a social commitment with somebody I don't care that much about, I think the best example is like a baby shower where it's like, I'm glad that you're happy, but I don't give a shit about any of this stuff. And maybe it's like leftover kind of girl comic, riot girl bullshit. That's just my way of posing. But it is that thing too, where it's like, I just don't, I don't care. So yeah. I don't want to play the game where, oh my God, and then who's going to have a baby next or whatever. It's like, I want to run so far away from this building and never be in that. So I think it's like when things are social commitments, 
uh, about things. <laughs> Maybe because yeah, they're it. not about well, me. Which is real. I know. I get no completely. It's like, but sometimes we have to do it because it's friends. But we can pop in, and just because we're there, it doesn't mean that we're having a good time. It's just you have to support. Like I, I should have gone to my friend Byron's uh, showing of uh, he just did Colbert, and I. I, I was so tired and I was just like, I can't, I love him to death. I'll take him out to dinner, but I'm going to watch the set at home. Yeah. Um, but you know, what's even funnier is that if any of your friends listen to this podcast and they're about to have a kid, they're like, well, Karen ain't coming. all right. So five, the next song is five forty five. Okay. Now, once again, this is flat out political. This song is about, in the title refers, it refers to how the media presents and desensitizes the viewer to violence of the class struggle. The narrator in the song is eating his breakfast and watching the news about an assassination or an attempted assassination, and now the dead bodies are on television. Mm -hmm. Um, You can hear it in the lyrics. Watch new blood on the 18th inch screen. The corpse is a new personality. There's one funny part in this before I get to the question. At 46 46 seconds in, Peter, he says, E10, E10. (laughs) Just play that on a loop, him saying eating, because it's so funny (laughs) to me. Eating, 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 eating. But yeah, he says, eating, eating all my food as I sit watching the red spot in the egg, which looks like all the blood you don't see on the television. Any uh, thoughts on the song? Or did you take notes? I did. Hit um, me. I wrote 545. The first time I listened to this, I could not believe this album was from 1979 because there's so many modern. It's like it's it's the album that we need in 2019. A hundred percent. So this much. Is so, they're so ahead of their time. But that just shows you how fucked up. It's like we're thinking we're living in like one of the, oh, this is the scariest time. Dude, it was like if they weren't getting nearly as much information. And if they're writing songs about this, it's always been bad. Yes. And especially I know very little about Thatcher's England, but I do know what a fucking asshole she was. And like that rebellion, it, it makes so much sense yeah. because she was awful. And um, yeah, so basically I said 545 is about watching the news, freaking out, which is very modern. But I had to fast forward because it was too menacing. A lot of down in the street lyrics. Sure. Um, you hate those down in the I ha- street. I, down in the street is basically it's somebody's about to tell you about like Myanmar or something. And it's like I, I just go like, oh, I can't. I'm, I don't use music this way. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least I don't go to music for this specifically usually. Sure. Uh, but but as living in 2019, I feel sl- you know slightly different about I think it's because I feel so stressed out all the time about what's going on that yeah. then you don't want to turn to music and just be like, oh, fucking Donald Trump's killing us all. Oh, yes, down in the street. <laughs> but don't forget what was happening down in the street in 1979. But this is why I think this song actually is perfect for you because you you work on a murder podcast. Yes, that's and true. Why are people? Because this is what he's saying: is that the the death is fascinating to him. Why are people so fascinated by this, by murder and and the destruction of, of basically humankind? I think it's. I think personally, it's. Um, I do it because it's something that's really happening that people pretend isn't happening. Like what they're, the point they're making is that they bring it to you and they desensitize you to it. So you don't care anymore. Sure. But, um, and that's one reaction that people might have, but then there's other, the other, which is kind of more of what our thing is, is it's happened and like the case didn't get solved or, you know, Ted Bundy killed 33 women and it didn't stop until, until they caught him like he went he tricked everybody and basically got away with it and was this wolf in sheep's clothing for years and years and years tricking cops tricking fucking everybody i saw the doc i've seen like five documentaries i'm fascinated by serial killers it's i am too and that's i'm not fascinated by the down in the street killing which is class struggle (laughs) and oppression and police brutality and that stuff isn't the of in, it's not you're an Ed Gein killer. That's what you. You're I like am. Ed Gein. I'm the specialist. I'm the one where it's the psychological aspect. It's it's a it's a lone wolf doing it for the weird reasons. Yeah. And not the, the oppression of the people, which is, you know, a whole different thing. And and also so overwhelming. But it's almost. I think it's like a way of processing how bad life is by taking it in these little pieces and going. Ooh, there was this one guy in New York in 19 and kind of. It's like letting the pressure out a little bit by going like this happens. Fuck, it's probably happening right now in Los Angeles. But oh yeah, in this very moment, sure, in a, the creepiest way that you can imagine. But like, instead of just freaking out about that, it's just like, well, 
you can focus on the one story and kind of process it. Do you ever watch a show called Fear Thy Neighbor? <laughs> yeah, I have seen it. I've seen every episode. <laughs> 60 hours of my life. 60 hours. I, it's one of my favorite shows. Some Be- of those, uh, I love those niche ones because they really can get, it's like, oh, you don't think you're that interested? How about if your neighbor does it? Yeah. And my thing is when it's um, the rich, when the love. rich fucking kill each other, I will watch any version of that story yeah. because it's like every, I was raised to believe like that's the dream. Like that's where you're supposed to get to. Those people are better than us. So those stories of like people coming in and just like, oh, you were supposed to give me $500 million, but you didn't. So now you're dead. Yeah. What is the most violent? violent thing you've ever witnessed witnessed yeah i was in south by southwest the year that that guy oh, wow. drove up the street and yeah. it was we were outside i believe it's the apache theater but i might be wrong about the name i think i think it is um so basically x was playing inside this open air theater and we walked up and it was me and two other comics walked up and we're like oh let's go see x and we had like the special comics passes um to go see it but there was a crazy line so we got in line i got in line and we were standing in line but the line was like really long so who um andy wood no no andy Andy, Andy Andy peters Peters. yeah i think i know this uh yeah he walked away to go see if we could get like does this pass mean anything to can we get in and um and my other friend kind of went to check something else out. And then I was standing there like holding our spot in line. And then I finally went, this is stupid because we can hear it just as good out here as we can. So I walked over to Andy to say, let's not wait in line. And that's when this guy turned the corner, broke through a barrier and drove up the line of people. So I was last in line like minutes before that guy turned up that street. How close were you to getting hit? Did you, were you guys like right there? Yes. I mean, you were right there, but like. We were standing on the sidewalk and the guy drove up the street. So, oh my. so out of the corner, but luckily Andy saw it. Um, I don't remember if Nick, Nick Stargo was the other person that was with us. And I don't remember which direction he was facing. I feel like he had his back to the street like me, but I heard it. I thought it was an explosion. And then I turned just enough to see people flying through the air and. And then I turned back because I was like, oh, do not fucking look at that. And then we basically turned around and saw it. And then it was just people. It was so crazy. It was like it seemed like somebody switched the set. So at first it was just people milling around in the street. And you turn back around. And it's just all these people lying down. It was it was nuts. And Andy Peters fucking grabbed both of us and goes, we have to get out of here right now. And he goes, don't look down. Do not look at the street. And he dadded us out of that fucking thing. And we just walked around the corner and walked away. Fuck. It was crazy. Yeah, and I it was, imagine. but the good thing was, so the comedy, we got in to see the bank. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing was, I love X. No, um, we walked back to the, like the comedy house where the comedy was taking place, but it was like, I would say four miles from where we were. Yeah. So all the adrenaline and crazy shit that was like in our system because we saw it, it was like we walked it out. I can't explain it, but no, I understand. I completely, your adrenaline was probably running so high and it's just, it, it, God, that's insane. It was, it was so insane. And I kept waiting. Like I called my sister and I was like, what if I have a nervous breakdown or like, what if something's waiting for me? Like whatever. And she's like, well, that's fine. But here's the thing. Like, you have to remember you, you it, it didn't happen to you so you don't have to suffer because it didn't happen to you because those people are suffering plenty that it did happen to and like you you can decide to end that right where you want to end it and not go any further into the horror of what happened that day oh yeah and it's like i just waited around for to like start bawling in the grocery store or something like or feel crazy but i think what it is is i know how fucking lucky I am that I didn't, I mean, I was moments away from being one of those people and I would have been hit first because I was last in line. Yeah. I didn't know if that was going to be a good question or (laughs) or not, but um, but that was a great answer. Oh, okay. Um, good. Good. Love is like anthrax. This is another one of my favorite songs on the record. Uh, you have John King singing and Andy Gill talking. Do you know which one this is? It's the final song on the record here. Let's play it.
this is the song they open with. The bass line and it, the guitar noises. Like you were talking about how Andy Gill doesn't give a fuck. He definitely did not give a fuck at the show. <laughs> so this is what the song basically is. Uh, John King is singing about love and how he's trying to avoid its pain while at the same time Andy Gill is giving a running commentary and critique on how most bands always sing about love <laughs> and how full of shit they are. <laughs> Which I love, dude, because literally Andy was sitting there like just while while the singer, the 21-year-old singer was like, with his, like all into the song and Andy Gill had his hands in his pocket like just looking at the audience just like, fuck love, <laughs> it's terrible. I love when he says, I feel like a beetle on his back and I love that they compare love to anthrax um, <laughs> what is the single most important relationship that you've had or had in your life God that's a good question the first uh, thinking you were asking romantically um, I had a boyfriend that when I stopped drinking was there for me in a way that I only realized 10 years later what a humongous gift it was and how much he did for me at the time yeah because i the reason i stopped drinking is because i started having seizures and i would have them as i went to sleep and uh, it, was, it was so fucked up but so when i so then i had a friend stay with me i had a seizure in front of her she was like so we went to the hospital then it i you know basically found out and the doctors all told me it was because of alcohol withdrawal. And I literally said to a doctor, but I've never stopped drinking <laughs> and like <laughs> thinking I was solving the problem. Yeah, like, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. it can't be that. I've never stopped drinking. Um, and it actually wasn't alcohol withdrawal because I still have, I take medicine now because I have seizures. I th gave myself brain damage basically from fucking drinking Fuck, so much and doing so much speed. Dude. Yeah, all for real. those keystones. I just hit it hard for a good 10 years and then I was out. Yeah. Um, so at that time, when I got out of the hospital, what I didn't realize, was there, as you also know, is when you stop doing that shit, there's all this left leftover stuff that you have not processed is just sitting there yep. from years and years things you've done and said and whatever and on top of that I had this new anxiety disorder because at night I would be afraid I was afraid to go to sleep because I was afraid to have a seizure because it's such a fucking creepy feeling so I would lay like lay down to go to bed and feel tired and then just like start shaking and it was crazy so this boyfriend at the time would literally hold me and talk straight into my ear and tell me like stories from camp when he was growing up and like just random shit and talk me to sleep every night until I got past that point Oh, that is beautiful. It was. No, he was the best. He was he, he was the best. I was a monster most of our relationship <laughs> because I was like in the beginning, we just like partied together and he was this guy that kind of showed up and I was like, whatever, I don't care. And of course, guys love that. So we were together for a while. But then it was like once I got sober, it was kind of like I, there was so much self-loathing and so much like I just made it so difficult. Yeah. You know what I mean? I get it. So that I would say, aside from like my sister, who is just, you know, my best friend and thank God for her, I would say it was him only because that it was like that the act of that. I think there's so many people that would be like, no, thanks. Like, this is way too much shit for me to handle. Yeah. And instead it was like. That's I think that's what love actually is. Did you did you I mean, after the fact and you were talking about now is like you can look back and be like, I was the dick. Have you reached out to apologize or thanked him for doing oh, that? Oh yeah. We talked we even after we broke up, we still talked all the time. Like I don't it was that kind of thing where it was like, This doesn't work right now, but we just always kind of had, you know, a line on each other. And I definitely apologized to him. You know, once I kind of start, really started going to therapy and really started like working some shit out, um, I can't remember if I sent him an email. I I think I sent him a card or an email that basically said that said all the things I just said to you. Whereas like, you know, I couldn't do it at the time, and I you know have my own issues. But yeah, you know, like, I get it. That was I've I've done the same. Th I've ruined so many good relationships because with beautiful people. Karen! <laughs> you want to do some facts? 
Mister. Let's do some facts. All right. And I feel <laughs> like some facts on some facts. Danu. Love I, is anthrax. I got some facts and I want some facts and I need some motherfucking facts. All right. Okay. Gang of Four was named by a member of the Mekons while driving around with Gil and King when he came upon a newspaper article on the intra-party coup against China's Gang of Four. That's now, right. do you know who they are? I looked it up only so that I wouldn't not know on okay. this podcast. So, uh, the Gang of Four was a political faction composed of four Chinese Communist Party officials. They came to prominence during the Cultural <laughs> Revolution, 1966 to 76. Good era for revolutions. <laughs> and were charged with a series of treasonous crimes. The gang's leading figure... Get ready for some name fuck ups. <laughs> Was Quayon Oing? I bet it's not Quayon Oing. I don't think so either. <laughs> it was Mao Zedong's last wife. Yep. The other members were Zhang Cucciano. <laughs> oh, that Italian guy? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yao Wenyan and Wang Hongwen. The Gang of Four controlled the power organs of the Communist Party of China through the later stages of the Cultural Revolution. Um, so who is your gang of four and what are each of their roles? Think of them in like superhero terms. You know, what's so great about this question. That's such a good question. Anyway. Thanks. But my therapist, I remember her saying, how many close friends do you have? And I said, I don't like 30. And she was like, no, 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 no. And she's like, maximum four, maximum and she's like, these are the people you tell everything to. These are the people you go to when you're, these are, these are the people you call on and need, whatever. She's like, 30 isn't even, you, that's not right. And she's like, and you can't take important things to just anybody. Yep. And just because Completely. you drink with people or party with people or do the same job as people doesn't mean that they're your actual friend. Like, she got me... It's such an interesting thing, but I just never, like, the definition of, like, what true friendship is or that, you know, compan companionship. My thing is always, like, who's in the car? Like, who's a, who's doing sets that night? Like, yeah. that's my best. I would always be, like, I'm really good friends with that person. It's, like, no, no, you've been into, to a party with them. Like, that's not the same thing. And especially in our business, there's so many people that are just, like, are sociopaths, and they can just be, like, oh, we're, I'm going to connect with you because that's what I want because that's how I will get something or, or whatever. And yes. it's, like... You're real friends. Real We're talking friends. real friends. Well, real friends, like, basically the people that don't bail when it gets shitty. And that's rare. And, like, you can't expect everyone to do that. Yeah. Um, so, it, that being said. Gang uh, of four. Here we go. <laughs> my sister, for sure. My sister, Laura. <clears throat> Uh, and which is funny, we laugh about it all the time because we, when we were growing up, she was the meanest older sister of all time. She's, but she taught me well because I was a completely like a lunatic. It just did, I didn't said whatever I thought. And she'd always be like, Tur -tur so she saved me from a lot of shit. But then she was just really bitchy and mean. But then, <clears throat> we went to um, the same college. She went to the JC first, and then we both went away to college at the same time. Yeah. And that was so amazing because even though she was still bitchy, she was always, like, making sure I was okay. And she was kind of like this, like, distantly and very judgmentally a guiding hand. And then when we were in our 30s, like, I was, you know, then it was just all fun because I was gone, and she would come and visit me, and I would go home for holidays or whatever. Sure. Then my mom got Alzheimer's and shit went fucking off the rails. And for a little while, I thought we we're going to hate each other forever because it was so hard and crazy. And I had so much guilt because I didn't live there and she was there every day and she was pissed. And there was just all kinds of shit. And now we are the closest we've ever been. And it is so good. And it's like, and we talk about it constantly because we were just like, how do we even live through? Because it, you know, when people have Alzheimer's, it goes on for fucking years. Yeah, I can imagine. 12 years. So. She's just like, and she's really smart about people. Like anytime there's anything going on in my life where I'm like, uh, this is what's going on, but I don't think this or what she is like comes through. It's hilarious. And she's just like, no, you don't do that. You don't do that. And you don't have to do that. Yeah. Never call that person back. Like she's, she's, she's just, she gets it. She's, she can, she can talk to you straight forward. She also agrees with you. But at the same time, it's like, she's. Uh, the voice of reason and, and truth that you need to hear. She always says things like eat the frog. Like you have to, you didn't call our aunt on her birthday. You have to call her now. And I'm always like, I just don't want to. And I'm the person that will never call a person again. That's my solution. And she's like, eat the frog, go call her right now. It's going to be uncomfortable. Just go do it. Like it's that kind of 
You guidance. need that kind of person in your life. Yeah. So much. Yeah. So because, you know, if not, you'll just be canceling because you're tired <laughs> forever. <laughs> All right. Who's who's number two? Um, OK. So my sister and then my sister's best friend, Adrian, is like my other sister. She, they've been best friends since sixth grade, since I was 10. So it's exact same answer. But sure. she, she's even meaner. But um, it's the best. And she's she's meaner in general, but nicer to me. And it's just our our system. Sure. Um, a recent ad is my friend Lizzie Cooperman. I don't know if you love know. Lizzie Cooperman, guys. If you follow Lizzie, if you're if if uh, if you're on social media, Lizzie is a brilliant comedian and just somebody that like I'm not extremely close with, but when I see her. We just get it, yeah, and we just talk. Like I've, I keep running into her into supermarkets, where I run into her all the time, <laughs> health food stores, yeah. And she's like, ah, and then I yeah, knew well, her when I started. I love her to death. She's a she's <clears throat> like a crystals person. She's like a person that's like trying to, and I do this too, but I think I have I have more sh- Catholic shame about it. Yeah. But it's that thing of trying to access something spiritual or something else. So you're not just always doing the same fucking comedy or this or a relation. Like there's Sometimes it's like you just keep moving the same pawns around all the time. And yeah. so it's like, I love when people are like, I went and took a Kabbalah class. And you're like, what the fuck are you talking yeah. about? She, that's Lizzie. <clears throat> I'd say my fourth, it's sad. I don't think you ever met him. My friend Danny Ceballos used to live in LA. Never met him. He, he was like in comedy. And <clears throat> I'm sure there's episodes of Mr. Show that he's actually like in or yeah. like in the audience or in the background or whatever. He's, he used to do tons of shit. He's one of the funniest people that didn't do stand up. Sure. He, so I love those people the most that are really funny and they don't want to perform. I'm just like, oh, how, how are you like that? Yeah. Um, and he, we worked at Ellen together. He was like, my right hand man for so long and then he got married and then his wife is a music a musicology professor oh wow i know amazing she's super cool but she got a job in wisconsin so they moved to wisconsin oh man yeah but you talk to him a lot i i I haven't talked to him for a while but we eat the frog i have to eat eat the the frog. frog I haven't talked to him, but it is that thing where I don't, when we talk to each other, it's exactly the same. Nothing's changed. It's exactly the same. But eat eat the frog. Uh, The group's debut single with the label at Homies a Tourist charted in 1979, invited to appear on top rated BBC music program, (laughs) Top of the Pops. (laughs) The band walked off the show when the BBC told them to sing rubbish in the place of the original lyric rubbers as the original line was considered too risque. The single was then banned by the BBC radio and TV, which lost the band support at EMI, and they began to push another band called Duran Duran instead. (laughs) Yeah, dude. Fuck. Have you ever had your integrity questioned, and have you ever walked off? (laughs) Um, Absolutely. God, I was right. I swear I didn't read that on um, Wikipedia or anything. But you knew that this band was going to be that fucking like, There's just balls to the wall. Because like. if you write songs like that, <clears throat> if you're writing Marxist songs, but then you go and say rubbish, who the fuck are you? Like, you can't do that. And of course they know that. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, these days it's so much more impossible because everyone's like, I'll just do whatever for whatever. Like, yes, very few completely. bands start out going, we're going to be telling people this, you know, I mean, like maybe it's going to happen. There, there are, I'm not going to lie to you. There aren't any bands like this anymore. Yeah. Like who's, who's this political? Like who is well, this? Like the closest is Rage Against Machine where it's like representatively completely. political. And, and, but I mean, and we need them more than ever. Yes. And it's like, they're doing, and I love Tom. I mean, they're doing, we like, I need Zach. I don't want Chuck D and I don't want fucking be real from, uh, from Cypress Hill. I want that band to yeah. fucking dude if the world is falling apart <laughs> yes it is it's falling apart that it's so bad in the world people millions of people are tuning into your podcast <laughs> to hear about this housewife being murdered that's like, right oh, i just want to calm down and relax Ooh. let's hear about the cooperman oh. uh, murder <laughs> <clears throat> right so when have you when has your uh, integrity been questioned um god that's funny well during the writer's strike I mean, that was the first, that was the first time I ever had to do anything that where I was called. I mean, the smaller versions of that would be when I was coming up in comedy, I fucking hated all of those shows that were like pretty funny women. There were, there were always women shows that had something to do with 
she's a whore, she's hot, or she fucks. They're still out she, there. I mean, that's all there are. But now there is now there's a lot of uh, pro feminist shows. Right. Like uh, Marcella uh, has that show, uh, Woman Crush Wednesday, and yeah. there's pants. Uh, cause now it's, they've taken the other approach, but it's like, which, which they should, they should, shouldn't have to be shows like that. Right. It should just be equal booking. You know, you're yeah. funny, you know, it doesn't make a difference what gen you are, then you're on the show. Right. Um, so, and I think back then it bugged me because it didn't feel these days, what female comics are doing is like, everybody's doing it for themselves and it's amazing and cool, whatever. But back then it was like, yeah, that was like, that's our show up in the belly room for girls. And I just feel like, fuck you. So I, there was a couple of those where I'm like, I just don't, I'm not going to do an all girl show. Yeah. I don't, that's not, I don't need to, and I don't want to. And I think it's fucked. You're doing it. I wouldn't like say that to a person. I would just say, no, thanks. And not do the show. Those were my tiny, uh, my, my tiny ways of doing it. But then the big way is just during the, the writer's strike, because it was so threatening. I was making so much fucking money compared to anybody. Oh, I can imagine, money dude. Motherfucker bought you a goddamn BMW it was that you traded in for a Honda Fit. I you traded fuck in. Face. But um, I think... One goes vroom, vroom. The other one goes vroom. <laughs> yeah, it's all farts. The second one is all farts. But A poopy mobile. <laughs> I think in that moment, though, like everybody was... Nobody knew how to deal with that. It was, it was like political action... In the mid, late 90s. I mean, yeah. 2000, sorry. Like in the aught, late aughts. So no one knew how to deal with it. Nobody wanted to lose money. Nobody wanted to lose a job. Everyone was fucking scared shitless. But then we had to do it. Like then it just became forced, you know, through the union. Sure. And I feel like when I went back and after I went back, I think we all knew I wasn't going to stay. Yeah. But they couldn't fire me because that would be illegal. Um, so they had to let me back. But then when I got there, there was it, of course, it was all very different and not great. And I just remember going, I'm not going to stay here. Like, there's no way I'm going to be working, technically working here anymore. It's clearly completely different than when I left. And so I'm just going to try to t leave these people with a little bit of like factual information before I leave is because they've clearly needed to tell they were telling stories where I was like what the fuck are you talking about it was like something they accused me of selling a story about the show to the Inquirer and shit because there was a story about so the strike in the Inquirer shit. yeah there was a bunch of stuff where I just went I, I've only been gone for four months and now I'm this person to you when I've worked here for five fucking years like you gotta be kidding me yeah but that was the kind of thing where I just went yeah like I went back and I sat in my chair and then I was and then when they tried to like they were it was really aggressive and really weird. And then I just went, I know you guys are in a bad place because you haven't had writers for four months, but you kept doing the show, which is the problem. And it's, we left so you wouldn't do that because you can't do that. Like you can't do a show without your writers who have made the show good sure. all this time. You know, so it's like you've been in a terrible place having to make something with no, you know, it's hard enough to do when there's a full staff, whatever. Completely. So... It was just, it was that kind of thing where it was like, I didn't fight and I didn't get dirty and I didn't go to the, where they were going. I just did the thing of like, I just want you to remember who you're actually talking to. Cause you've decided I'm someone I'm not. So I'm just reminding you that you're wrong about that. Good for you. And then I fucking left. Yeah. So it was, you know, it, the whole thing though, nobody wanted it to happen. And it was so terrible for everybody across the board. Like it's it was political action. It was great. No one does that in Hollywood. I like, remember that. That was like what two thousand and eight. Yeah, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Yeah. It was awful. Um. All right, a couple more. Thank. We're. I hope you don't mind. This. This went. I'm oh, no. having so much fun. Yeah. So. Good. Good. Fuck yeah. Fuck everybody. Fuck everybody. <laughs> um. By the way, she did uh, move the time of this podcast nine <laughs> times. I mean, six p.m. <laughs> two p.m. 4 p.m.? 1 p.m. How's 1 p.m.? <laughs> How's what? I was like, man, fuck it, don't. All right, here we go. The album's artwork was designed by band members John King and Andy Gill. You mentioned this earlier. The cover, designed by King, shows the influence of the Situationist International, a group which became famous during the Paris 1960 student-led revolution in France. Oh, the cover depicts an Indian shaking hands with a cowboy in three heavily processed versions of the same image based on a still from one of the oh, I'm gonna fuck this up. Winnetou films starring Lex Barker and Pierce Bryce, 
which had been very popular in communist East Germany mm. as critical narrative of capitalism. So here we go. This is what it is. If you guys look at the, the title or the, the cover, it's the faces are reduced to blobs of red and white. Uh, that is to the stereotypical racial colors. A text that winds around the images reads, you know, this is where this is important. The Indian smiles. He thinks that the cowboy is his friend. The cowboy smiles. He is glad the Indian is fooled. Now he can exploit them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> In this way, it approaches themes of exploitation, but taken the lyrical content of the album, it may also point to the simplistic depictions of ethnic, social, or political conflict in the media as cowboys and Indians, okay? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been exploited <laughs> in your life? <laughs> or have you used, uh, or your, have you, or has your friend's lives been exploited in your writing? This is, a more, this is not as heavy, because we've all been exploited. I tried to write this with one of my producers, and I was like, yeah, well, I mean, they're always exploiting us, but have you exploited your own life or your friend's lives in your writing? Well, when I first started stand-up, and probably the whole time, I would constantly steal from my friends who weren't stand-ups, where if they said something funny, I'd be like, I, I have to take that, and would take shit constantly. One of my first bits that I loved was I would just do a series of impressions, but they were, they were like, it was one was a Broadway dancer who just finished rehearsing the big number yeah. and was now uh, getting directions from the choreographer. Yeah. Um, that was one impression I did. And the other one was, here's your mom dancing at a wedding. And oh, it was, great. it was completely stolen from my friend Alicia. Um, but we used to do it like when we were drunk joking around. So like I, I had no, uh, respect for anybody's <laughs> you know the thing where like you hang out with funny people who don't perform so that you, you always have yeah, material you get something yeah yeah and so you're like oh these this is a bit we do together it's like sure. no it was her idea you sure. just you just took it um i have also mined my father he is truly one of the funniest people like i've ever met and he just comes out with these one-liners that it's just it's because he had eight brothers and sisters and it's that whole irish talking thing sure um but i mean i've i've taken shit for i mean half the reason i have twitter followers is because of shit my dad say that i uh, has said <laughs> shit my dad said like literally i just write it down in autumn 2010 microsoft used the song naturals not in it in sports focus advertisements for the kinetic which was their like motion capture xbox 360 video game system uh, they also used the same song in the 2006 film Marie Antoinette. Mm. Now, this is why I'm bringing it up. For a band that was so against selling out, they eventually did. Sure. Have you sold out? Yes. <laughs> yes. So much. I guess I felt that way when I started, when I worked on Ellen, because it was daytime television. So it wasn't like working on a nighttime show. Yeah. It wasn't working on a. a purely comedy show it was a whole other area it's a whole yeah that's like that's the most un rock star shit yeah for a person that's like you know probably wearing you probably had like 19 flannels in your closet <laughs> you know the, the ripped tights that I had to just put it away. take everything take everything I want you to uh, yes, yes how you doing DJ <laughs> DJ Twinkle Toes whatever the fuck their names are and you're like you're coming in like ding 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 I want the big of the big ding 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 And on the songs I'm just like little fish Could you change that monologue? It's this needs to be about jeans, not butterflies. It was like jeans and butterflies comedy so my thing was like i wanted it to be the funniest thing it could be yeah. but they didn't want that i mean not not that uh, obviously ellen did and but th that wasn't anybody else's goal they were like we need good daytime ratings however you get those and and the judgment was women who are at home wa watching the kids watching daytime tv don't give a shit about the comedy aspect sure. of it so that was a bit of a fight um, that sometimes I felt like a total sellout because it was just like, well, I can't do anything. I can't serve the way I want to serve. So I just have to like make this as good as I possibly can. But it felt bad. It felt bad until Doug Benson said something to me and he was like, I love the show. And I was like, oh, you're the biggest bitch around. So like, that's the, you're the last person I thought would ever be nice about this. I know for a fact you're not doing it to be nice to me. Like that, it was like this genuine compliment where I kind of was like, okay, maybe this 
didn't all didn't go as badly as I thought sure, it did, you sure. know, because I that definitely was like, I need money. I, I needed to ma- I wanted to make sure I had money so that if my mom had to go into a home, we would pay for a nice one and not a shitty one. Sure. So that was it all got turned around and then it felt, you know, it felt bad. But that's also because Kurt Cobain made it so that we all felt bad about any success at all. Drummer Hugo Burnham was an English major at Leeds who at one point formed a theater group influenced by the writings of Karl Marx, the 19th century German philosopher and co-founder of communism, but grew tired of preaching to the converted as he quoted, as he was quoted saying in Melody Maker. Okay. What did you study and do you feel like it helped you in your career? I also, like Hugo, studied theater. (laughs) Um, I thought you were about to say communism. (laughs) Uh, No, I was a theater major, for, but I only went to college for a year and a half. Then I flunked out. Um, Where were you going? Sac State. Sac State. Sacramento. But it was whatever. Um, You didn't finish anyway, so it's not. Didn't finish. Doesn't doesn't matter. Still owe my dad money. Um, (laughs) I owe Sally Mae so much money. (laughs) Defer, <laughs> defer. That's all I'm doing is defer. Just defer that shit. Yeah. Um, but I do think here's what it taught me. Um, the politics in a theater department are fascinating because oftentimes just the same people get cast as in the leads all the time, especially in the musicals. Andy Bachman. <laughs> right? Andy, everybody's Andy. Andrew Bachman. Yeah. Yep, he always got it. You can't or get Jordan around Wong. those people because it's, and then, but I start to realize, like, I remember one audition, which was like, it was an open audition, but they were only really reading. It was like, everyone was sitting there like, we could all read for any part, but they really were only reading these certain people. Yeah. And I, re- I sat there never getting picked to read, and I realized they know what they want and they're looking for people to fit into these molds. And if you don't look like one of the people that fit into the molds, they don't, they have no need for you. Sure. So either you have to look like a mold fit or go do something else that's not structured like this. You know what I mean? Like it was that, and it was one of the first places where I was like, I always wanted to be a comic since I was like 12. But that's when I started going, yeah, I, I picked theater because it's performing, but it isn't actually what I want to do. Yeah. It's just a version of something in the meantime. It's just something that, that'll, that'll like warm you up for it. Dude, I was a bar mitzvah DJ for seven <laughs> years. And I remember I, I, was, I wasn't like enjoying it at first. And then the guy that ran the company, Steve Lampiris, who also uh, didn't believe in uh, evolution, wrote a whole book about how evolution's not real. Wow. Yeah, I swear to God, dude. You can find him. It's, 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 he's like, he was like a 1950s guy. Talk like this. He was the greatest DJ, greatest bar mitzvah DJ I'd ever seen in my life. But he he would say, hey, Bubba, he's like, what you need to do, you want to be a comic, so get used to it here. Make jokes, like, to be funny. And I was like, yeah, dude. And so for seven years, you know, I, I created this confidence yeah. that helped me. And so when I first started stand-up, even though my jokes sucked, I was at least... I at least knew how to be present on stage and to be somewhat entertaining. And you know that like from that example from Hot Tub, the attitude you have when you're doing, it's like the material actually doesn't matter. The material is nothing. It's not. It is nothing. It is It is 90% just confidence and just belief in what you're doing. Yeah. So this is about at home, he's a tourist. Gang of Four singer John King told Clash Magazine, the song was on our debut Fast product EP, which became a big indie hit, but we weren't paid a cent for our work, majorly ripped off. So we re recorded it for entertainment. I regret not punching out the bloke who ran the label. <laughs> God, he's just, they're so badass. That's so good. Note to self do this before you die. Uh, I wrote that. There you go. We're often. Punch at, out a guy that runs a label? Just to, oh, man, I just want to punch somebody out. It's, I've no, I don't think I've ever really done it. I've been in fights, but not punch somebody. Well, that's not true. We're often asked, why do you sign to a major label if you're so alternative? One answer, EMI at least paid us for the records it sold. Mm -hmm. All right. So when did you say, I've arrived? When did you have that moment? Like you were being compensated. uh, You were being compensated adequately for your worth. I have to say it feels like it's very recently. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and maybe only because in the times where I've had success before, I have been so fucked up internally that I couldn't. I mean, I've had I've kind of like conceptually made it and lost it like literally four times. So so 
I think, especially after, like the first time I moved down and then I got a holding deal for, from NBC. Oh, that's big. And I honestly thought I was like rich forever and it was 75 grand. But I was like, rent's on me. I'll <laughs> yeah, get the oh, pot. Yeah. Like, Dude, 75 grand when you're broke uh, is might as well be $50 million. It, it, truly. And it was yeah. like, I, I didn't really go like, oh, but half of that's going to go to taxes. I did nothing. I was just like, what the world is our oyster. Um, and then of course, but that was when I was drinking and on speed. And so that ended very quickly. And I also was like very uncomfortable with the insane pressure of being on camera. I mean, like you just are never, you're never okay on camera. Um, or I wasn't, I should say. Sure. Um, but I think really short answer is just the recently with this podcast <clears throat> with, with my favorite murder kind of exploding at first, like when it first happened, Georgia would go, Oh my God, look, we're number one or whatever, or we have whatever. She would show me some kind of stat and I would like take her hand and go, I just need you to know this is going to end. So get ready for the bad part. Cause like, you, cause you had been through it yes. and you would just, said, and I was just positive. You said, if you hear my story about the NBC <laughs> holding deal, <laughs> Have you heard Sit about down. that? I just keep sitting her down and lecturing <laughs> her. But it really was this thing where I was like, don't trust this. Don't love it. Certainly don't like get used to it because this shit is fleeting. And when we're not popular anymore, you're going to be brokenhearted. And I don't want you. I, I, of course, never said it that maturely. I was like, no, it doesn't matter or whatever. Yeah. And it just kept going. And I think the real feeling of being a, of like, I have arrived is other comics complimenting it because they just don't do that. And yeah. people going out of their way to say, Oh my God, I listen and I like it is like mind blowing to me. And when that started happening, I was like, maybe this isn't cause I also do things and never look at them again or listen to, I don't like, I just go like, ah, I did it and I can't do anything about it anymore. Yeah. You know, have that feeling. So people going like, Oh my God, that episode was great or something was such a, it just hadn't really happened that much before. So then I was like, yeah, I guess this is different than the usual. And yeah, so the build of that, I just kept waiting for it to fall off. Cause it, it was never like, did. It just, if anything, it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. So the, I think the moment I, I said to Georgia, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about was the moment I felt like I had arrived <laughs> because it was that thing of like starting stand up. You want to seem like it's like I want to be like Janine Groflo, but with this with a touch of Laura Keitlinger. Like you always have this plan of what you you think you can control how people see you, yeah. and you think you know how you're funny. And the truth of it is, you don't you don't know why you're funny. You just have to do your thing and then let them receive you the way they want to. Like that's the truth of it. Yeah. And then when you're doing that and actually not going, I'm going to make you think I'm cool, or I'm going to make you think this thing about me you're free and then people can enjoy you the most i think it, it's it really is man this this really is fucking great dude it's just to people are going to love this just to hear like it's it's literally enjoy every fucking moment like even when you listen to gang of four or any of these other records like you guys get to listen to the greatest recorded music in the history of <laughs> mankind possibly see them <laughs> if you can if just if you can just get guys and the moral of the story is Leave your house. <laughs> Go to the concert. Go yeah. to the concert of love. It is. It is. I love you so much. This was so I much fun. I love you too. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Y'all sound and piss and say that's what I live for. Jink, jink, oh, oh, oh. Then I get my oh, 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 and then I oh, oh. Karen Kilgariff, everybody. She might have flaked on the concert with me, but she did not flake on coming through with an amazing episode, and I cannot thank her enough. At Karen Kilgariff on Twitter, check her out on her podcast, My Favorite Murder. Seriously, guys, it's fantastic. And her and Georgia will be on tour. Uh, you can see them on March 9th at the Park Theater in Vegas. Go to myfavoritemurder.com for all tour dates. I'm going to be posting her mixtape track listing link and email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. And uh, March 20th, guys, we're going to be doing the goddamn comedy jam at the Roxy. Karen's going to be there. It's going to be the shit. Go to my website, joshadamyers.com. I haven't updated it in forever, so I don't even know why I list that. For all things 500, go to the500podcast.com. 
Please subscribe on your favorite platform to listen to podcasts. Rate, review. Guys, please give me a five-star review. Give me that 24-hour ad, too. We also created a club, guys. It's called the 500 Club. Get the podcast a day early on Record Store Tuesdays, guys. And starting March 1st, we are giving away an unreleased episode of my old podcast that never got released exclusively for Patreon members. It's me sitting down telling stories with some of my favorite comics about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And then we're going to be creating a podcast with me, Morty, and Matt Pinfield specifically for the 500 club members of the Fleece Army. So, join the movement. The 500 club is awesome, guys. Do it for me because I want to get out of this apartment the 500 podcast.com backslash club for all details on Patreon membership. Now, we just listened to Gang of Four from 1979. Now, here is an artist that was directly influenced by this album. From Inglewood, California, we have Fever 333 with their new single, Burn It. And if you are in a band and were directly influenced by one of these albums or artists and you want your music featured on the 500, send your song to. 500 podcast at gmail.com make sure you put the album and artist that influenced you in the subject next week is steve earl week with his 1986 debut album guitar town so y'all got some homework to do stay fleecy do your homework So burn